Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for what I think promises to be a very interesting conversation about vaccine distribution. And at the beginning, I also want to thank the Fondation Brochet for organizing this and other meetups in order to contribute to important public debate on the current pandemic. Now, the speakers from today's panel are all alumni from the Fondation Brochet from 2008, so it's a great opportunity to sort of meet up again. They'll introduce themselves each before their own presentation, and they, when they give their remarks, they'll be specific to one or more countries. Now, the format for today's conversation will be as follows. Each speaker will uh, provide information about one or more countries. Following that, there'll be an open discussion amongst the panelists and then at about the halfway mark, we hope to open it up for conversation. That's an opportunity for you to put comments or questions in the chat function. So the topic today is vaccine distribution within countries. But I want you to understand that this is a very challenging topic and not only because of shifting information, but also because this is happening against a backdrop of profound global inequity, as you can see displayed on this slide. We are 8 billion people. At this point, a fraction of the 8 billion people have been vaccinated. This is a statement that was published yesterday by the head of UNICEF and WHO, which essentially puts this graph into words, and I think clearly admonishes us to do the right thing. The point is so important that I want to read it. Of the 128 million vaccine doses administered so far, more than three quarters of those vaccinations are in just 10 countries that account for 60% of the global GDP. As of today, almost 130 countries with 2.5 billion people are yet to administer a single vaccine. I want to say this at the outset so that people understand that while we're focusing with vaccine distribution within countries, we have to remember that we have a huge problem with respect to the distribution between countries. With that introduction, I'm the first to speak. I'm Francoise Bayless, and I'm not only going to be chairing this session, but I'll also be speaking to the information about two countries, Canada and the United States. I'm a university research professor at Dalhousie University in Canada. Canada has decided to prioritize vaccines, like a number of other countries have done, in a series of discrete stages. What you see here are the official national recommendations, but what happens actually varies from province to province and also within the territories. Our prime minister has said that the goal is to vaccinate all Canadians by sometime this fall. That's a challenging goal as we haven't received very many vaccines proportionate to the population. We're a population of nearly 38 million. What I wanna highlight for you are the people identified in stage one of the vaccine rollout. It starts with long-term care residents and staff. It then looks at the elderly and that's defined as people 70 years of age and above. And the idea is that you would start with those at 85 years of age and above, and then move down in increments of five years till you get to 70 years of age and above. Then come the healthcare workers, and after that, Indigenous communities. So I want to stress for you two things about this list. First, we've actually named those who are most at risk in terms of their age and living situation. After that have come the healthcare workers. But the other thing that I think is unique to Canada is that we've actually named indigenous populations amongst the first recipients of the vaccine. 
And I draw that to your attention because in fact, there are a number of countries around the world with indigenous populations. And I'm not aware of any other country that has targeted them for early access to the vaccine. And I think that speaks to certain kinds of decisions with regards to the values that are trying to be pursued. One last comment about Canada is that we are one of the worst perpetrators of vaccine nationalism. To date, we have purchased up to 398 million doses of vaccine. I'll remind you, we're a country of 38 million. And that means that in principle, we have 10 doses per person. In the abstract, this wouldn't be a problem if we had a good plan in place to gift the excess vaccine. To this point, if our government has such a plan, it hasn't been made public. The next country I want to speak with you about is the United States. And again, what you see here is the official recommendation. But what happens is again, state specific. Currently, if you just look at the phases and then focus on phase one, what you see is that currently 150 million people, which is nearly half the population of the United States is eligible to be vaccinated. But what's important is to appreciate the rollout for that first phase. And you'll see here that the ordering and the listing is somewhat different from Canada, their neighbors to the north. Phase one was recommended on December three of last year. And there the focus is on healthcare workers of which there's supposed to be 21 million and residents of long-term care facilities of which there are approximately 3 million. After they've been vaccinated, but there is some overlap, as you can see in the diagram, the expectations you move to phase 1B and 1C, and the recommendations in these two categories were made late in December, so around the 22nd of December. Now, what's interesting is that since then, mid-January, a number of federal officials have been encouraging states to open up eligibility such that you'd be looking at phase 1C, in other words, adults, who are at high risk because of underlying medical conditions and adults 65 years of age and older. What's interesting to me, looking at this from a bit of a distance, is it's unclear what's happened with phase 1B, the essential workers category. And one of the reasons I wanna highlight this is because one of the groups identified in there is the educational sector. And what we do know so far is that there's been a fair bit of controversy around something like Q jumping. Two quick examples have been in New York, where people who are university professors who are in fact very well protected by virtue of their possibility to work from home have been getting access to the vaccine. Another place is California, where academic physicians who also can work safely from home have had access to the vaccine before residents who are on the front line. Interestingly, I would say that the United States is also guilty of vaccine nationalism insofar as they have a preponderance of the factories able to produce the two vaccines that are currently available, the two mRNA vaccines that have been approved, Pfizer and Moderna. And at this point, they're not sharing that vaccine with the world. The vaccines are to be used for Americans first. And we're starting to see that in other places, including the European Union. With that, we pass on to the next country, Switzerland. Thank you, Francoise. I'm Gaia Barazzetti. I'm a senior researcher from the University of Lausanne. I'm a philosopher as a background, and my field of expertise is research ethics and public health ethics. And I'm working in Lausanne in a unit um, uh, focused on uh, participatory research involving publics uh, from the very first pages of uh, research projects. So, in Switzerland, the, um, the vaccination campaign is uh, presented as a primary public health uh, uh, action, uh, which is oriented at public health goals, reduce the number of severe cases of the disease and of the number of deaths, ensure the provision of healthcare can be maintained, and uh, undirectly reduce the negative health and psychological and social and economic impact of the, of the pandemic. 
Voluntariness is uh, presented as a very important uh, value in the vaccination campaign. Of course, there are limited resources in terms of scarcity of the vaccine, so the Confederation decided to prioritize groups. Um, as uh, uh, it is not yet clear if vaccination prevents transmission, uh, the general uh, uh, message from the Confederation is that the hygiene and social distancing rules should remain important uh, and a very important besides uh, the vaccine uh, uh, disposal. The communication to the population is mainly done through messaging uh, focused on primary prevention, meaning how to protect oneself from and others from the infection and so on. Uh, which is provided through um, websites, dedicated websites. There is a national, federal websites and cantonal websites. As to the priority groups, uh, they are um, organized in two main groups. Um, the elderly population and those at higher uh, risk comes, uh, come first. Uh, and then um, uh, people who, li who live in retirement and care home and, uh, and the staff in contact with them. And then after that come uh, the healthcare professional caring for people at high risk, people aged uh, from 65 and 74, people under 65 who have uh, not uh, yet been vaccinated, and then close contacts of people at especially high risk and people in communal facilities such as residences for uh, uh, people suffering from disabilities. Um, Switzerland rollout is highly decentralized. The federal government secures and delivers doses and sets the overall vaccine strategy, but uh, every single uh, one of the 26 cantons are responsible for executing uh, the vaccination rollout. Uh, as per most recent data available, um, there has been uh, um, uh, the vaccination has been done for uh, almost 4.5% of the population so far. Um, and countries such as Denmark and Israel have reached uh, higher vaccine rates than Switzerland. This is probably also due to the fact that uh, um, there is this decentralized approach which brings uh, opportunities but also challenges. Opportunities because cantons can adapt uh, the other uh, vaccination recommendations uh, to the to their context but also challenges because um, there, there is a need for a strong IT system to have a good two-way information flow from the cantons to the federal government and this is sometimes lacking in Switzerland. The public is told to visit the canton websites to make an appointment, but this can be everything from a telephone line, uh, as in the southern canton in Ticino, or a fully digitalized online questionnaire and appointment list, as in uh, the road canton where we are. Um, <clears throat> the vaccine rollout is also complicated in Switzerland because uh, um, we are developing, but still we don't have a centralized system for digital medical records nor a digital national immunization system to rely on in contrast to many other countries such as Israel, Denmark and the Netherlands. Um, overall, uh, even if the rollout has not been as fast as smooth uh, as, uh, as we would hope, Switzerland is still part of the selected group of countries around the world of the 40 wealthy countries to have access to the doses at all, which is already an, an, a privilege. Thank you. Hello, I'm Angus Clark. I'm a clinical geneticist in Cardiff in Wales. And um, I'm not sure, maybe Wales is the smallest sort of country being considered here today. I'm not, I'm not, not, not quite sure but we have a population of just under, or just about 3 million. Um, I, th I think the, the main priority for not only Wales, but the UK has been to try and avoid the hospital system and the healthcare system being overwhelmed by, by COVID. And um, when it comes to uh, the clinical, or when it comes to the prioritization for vaccines, I've listed them here, and it's very similar uh, to other other countries, I think, with the top priority being for the um, adults resident in care homes and their carers. And then after that, well, um, because they are the, the most vulnerable group, and then after that, people over 80 and healthcare and social care workers and then just um, working it out by age 
from then on, uh, down to people 50 years and over and then younger adults. And there's no particular plan to immunize children at the moment. I mean, in terms of the broader UK context, I mean, we've had more than our fair share of vaccine nationalism. Um, we've had this, well, this rhetoric always from, from the government about being world beating. And at the moment that seems to be in death rates more than anything, well, a combination of both death rates and vaccine rates. Britain is doing quite well at in both. Um, but we have a lot of com complexities here with the vaccine nationalism being conflated with arguments about Brexit and arguments about the future of Ireland um, and it's of, of Northern Ireland within the island of Ireland. So, so that's, you know, I don't want to recap all that, but that's causing a lot of problems and I could imagine it becoming, you know, a, a very serious problem. Um, with resurgence of terrorism and so on in, you know, in the not too distant future, who knows? Me, I hope not, but it's possible. The, the other debate that has been happening, but not so loudly, has been about triage. Um, so by this, I mean the prioritization of care for patients um, needing intensive care and concern amongst disability rights groups and so on, that, that they will not be um, given fair access. But that's slightly separate from the question of immunization uh, because people in particularly vulnerable groups uh, are uh, given priority for, vac for vaccination. Okay, I think that's all I need to, to say. Thank you. Thank you, Angus. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Bjorn Hoffman. I'm a professor uh, in the philosophy of medicine and ethics at the Norwegian University for Science and Technology, but also at the University of Oslo. And we also are a quite small country, uh, 5.4 million people. Uh, up till today, we've had 492 deaths of, of COVID-19. And as you can see, uh, the uh, criteria and the faces are very much uh, like what has been presented already. So I won't uh, go into all the details. Uh, what I will do is tell you a little bit about uh, how these criteria uh, came up because uh, what uh, was done in Norway was that we commissioned a report by the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Uh, this was a interdisciplinary group of experts who first started with defining the values uh, and then based on those define the goals and then uh, these criteria. So uh, the values they identified first for making the goals and the criteria were equal respect, welfare, equity, trust and legitimacy. And based on these, uh, they elaborated uh, five specific goals. The first was to reduce risk of death the second was to uh, reduce the risk of serious illness. The third was to maintain essential services and clinical uh, or critical infrastructure. Uh, and the uh, fourth was uh, protecting employment and also protecting the economy. So based on these values and goals, these uh, nine uh, groups uh, or criteria were identified, which you see. Uh, and then uh, there has been a substantial internal debate whether uh, we should uh, uh, vary uh, these criteria and how dynamic uh, they should be, specifically with regards to infection and spread of infection. Uh, and um, in Norway, we have uh, two vaccines. We have the Pfizer and the Moderna, uh, the number of persons who are vaccinated so far or have got the vaccine is about 180,000 have the first dose, that's about 3.3% of the population, and uh, who then have the two doses is about 50,000 people, which is 0.9 or 1% of, of the population. Uh, so uh, we're more or less in the beginning of rolling out the vaccines. And uh, we expect there to be more debates on where to roll out the first part and how to prioritize. I think what is lucky in Norway is we have 
comparatively few infected and very few deaths. Uh, and the society and the country is very homogeneous. Uh, so uh, that uh, may help in making some of the priority setting issues in the future, but we do expect uh, uh, some debates and we are also very much engaged in the international and global issue, as also Francis uh, pointed out. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. My name is Jan Erik. Um, I work uh, for a development work NGO film and uh, come from uh, Obu Academy University Social Sciences. My own uh, on the ground experience on COVID-19 uh, is from Hong Kong as a resident until mid 2020 and, and then from Finland from then after. In Finland, like in Switzerland, voluntariness is a starting point with vaccinations. And it's offered for free for everyone 16 years or older who are willing to take the vaccine. And the vaccinations are carried out by municipalities in their respective area. Regarding the vaccination order, we have first uh, social and healthcare personnel who work with COVID-19 disease infected. Secondly, those people 70 years or older. And thirdly, persons at high risk for severe COVID-19 disease due to underlying health conditions. And this category was last week divided in two groups based on the severity of underlying conditions. Now, when looking at public attitudes and trust towards vaccination, recent surveys and ongoing studies underline that most Finns take a positive attitude towards a coronavirus vaccine. And uh, the start of the COVID-19 vaccination campaigns has actually increased the trust to vaccines. Currently, the willingness to take the vaccine is up to 70% and, and higher. What can we draw from here? Finland can be char characterized as a trust society. Trust in general is high for the government, police, authorities. And this also reflects the trust towards COVID-19 vaccinations. And then um, moving to Hong Kong. Yeah, the government of Hong Kong decides which type of vaccine is provided depending on different circumstances. Proposed vaccination order. Firstly, elderly persons with disabilities and other residents in institutional fac facilities, they come first. Secondly, workers in healthcare settings who are at increased risk or of exposure to COVID-19. Thirdly, persons of 60 years and above. And fourthly, persons with chronic, chronic medical problems uh, and age between 16 and 59. In Hong Kong, residents remain wary of being vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, potentially adverse side effects and the quick rollout of the program has been some of the key concerns. And government has been asked to provide more information about the vaccines. And one of the examples to roll out delay of Sinovac and final stage trials has been a concern with public. And many members of the public have adopted a sort of wait and see attitude towards vaccinations. According to polls, Currently, about one third of the population is willing to take the vaccine, and one third is undecided. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to everyone for those contributions. I just want to make a couple of general remarks, and then we're going to move into a panel discussion that will be followed by conversation with uh, those present. 
The first thing I want to say very clearly is that what the information that we've been able to present today is illustrative. It is not representative. That's probably obvious, but I wanted to be able to say that up front. So for example, we haven't mentioned a single country in Africa, and that's not only because they don't have access to the vaccine, it's also a function of those who were eligible to participate in this panel having been at the Fondation Brochet in 2008. So I just wanted to be clear about that. The second thing that I think is really important to emphasize, which I said at the beginning, is that we are 8 billion people on this planet. And we currently have a huge problem in terms of supply and demand. So the demand part of the equation is 8 billion. The capacity for vaccination is much lower. So right now, even at maximum capacity, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine production is at most likely to achieve 2 billion doses by the end of 2021. And given that two doses are needed, that's at most 1 billion people. It sounds like a lot, but it's relative to the demand. If we look at Moderna, they have said 6 million doses by the end of 2021. So that's 300 million people. Now, again, that sounds like a large number, but it's not relative to the demand. And on top of that, we do have other vaccines coming on stream, whether that be Johnson & Johnson, uh, Novovax, AstraZeneca, it's unclear. And part of the reason things are now going to continue to be unclear has to do with the new variants and whether or not the vaccines in development or about to be authorized for use. Uh, will be effective against these new variants. So we have a shifting uh, backdrop that we need to think about. The other thing I want to draw to everyone's attention is that you have seen priority listing that has a lot of commonality in terms of where uh, different countries have chosen to invest. And you've heard different comments about goals and objectives. And again, many of them are similar, an attempt to reduce cases, an attempt to reduce illness, an attempt to reduce deaths. Uh, attention to the capacity of the healthcare system, attention to uh, the importance of uh, well functioning of society, <clears throat> excuse me, including the economy. Now, it's because of these background conditions that I want to ask the panelists to comment on the following. All countries to date have come up with some kind of prioritization scheme. Some countries have had more success than others. And here we've started to hear stories about vaccine wastage, about not being able to get to the target groups and other types of challenges. In response to this, people have now started to argue for an open access approach to vaccination, whereby we would set aside any kind of listing and the sole goal is to get more vaccines into people. I think about this as a commitment to efficiency over equity and the advanced ethical justification for this is that as you increase the number of people who are vaccinated, regardless of starting assumptions about their risk factor, you ultimately will protect everyone because you'll move more quickly to population immunity or what is sometimes called herd immunity. So that's the kind of summary of what we've talked about thus far. And it's an effort to ask a pointed question of all of the panelists as to whether or not you think it's a good idea that your country has the particular prioritization it does have, whether you would wanna change that prioritization or whether you're sympathetic to this claim that we'd be better off without any kind of prioritization. I'm gonna open it up and ask Gaia to start us off with a comment. Okay, I think um, due to uh, the limited vaccination capacity and the, the need to um, try to have an impact immediately on the, on the pandemic through vaccination, we really need to go first through this prioritization. Uh, so I don't think it's a good option to, to have an open access uh, approach. Um, I also think that um, we should not forgive in in uh, in, the, in the in the governance of this uh, uh, vaccination campaign that public trust is important, 
and that um, um, vaccine-based protection is also contingent on public trust and can only be achieved by ensuring effective community engagement. So um, it's true that prioritizing it also involves um, micromanagement of these uh, uh, stratified groups, and this is not easy to do. But I I, I believe that um, more community engagement, uh, more involvement of uh, um, publics, uh, which is not an homogeneous entity. There are groups with special needs. Um, that would be helpful in uh, um, improving this this uh, micromanagement that we need to have to to have an effective vaccination campaign. Anyone else want to weigh in on this question of whether or not we should be having any kind of prioritization list, whether you would change the list that you're aware of, or whether you think there's value in moving to an open access program? I can I can chip in if that's okay, Francois. I mean, I'm sure that some prioritization is is necessary because particularly say for people who live in closed institutions, so that's the elderly and people in prison uh, and people in long stay hospital and so on. Um, I think they are very vulnerable, and they are not going to be first to get out to an immunisation centre. Uh, unless a, a very real effort is, is made. So I think those include institutions. But there's an important point about low paid work. So people who have to do, whose work involves a lot of face-to-face -face work. I mean, health and social care workers are generally high up in many countries prioritization, but people who uh, they work in shops or in public transport and, uh, other, other types of support services um, are, are low paid, have to do face-to-face -face work and are not on the priority lists. So there's an issue about that and how to define, how to get those people, their immunizations with, with the, an appropriate priority and drawing definitions I think is very difficult. And this overlaps with the question of ethnicity. So you mentioned, um, about indigenous populations and how Canada has addressed that. So in the UK, it's a bit different. I wouldn't say we don't have any indigenous populations. Everyone here is a fairly recent immigrant in the last few thousand years. So, you know, there's, there's nobody is indigenous. So it, it's, yeah, so, so and, and there's a lot of conflation uh, so that there, there is clearly a high infection and high mortality rate in some of the Black and Asian and other minority ethnic groups. Um, but there's the social factors confound that, and it's very difficult to disentangle what is sort of genetic from what is, is to do with uh, social and occupation and housing and poverty. So it would be... That would be a real challenge to work out, I think. Yeah, just to add to that, I think that jurisdictions that are choosing to collect data about race and access to vaccination are uniformly showing that there's discordance between the number of people in high risk situations as compared with the number of people who are able to get access to the vaccine, either because the vaccine is not available in their neighborhoods or there are issues of trust in terms of accessing the vaccine. So I think that's a very important point, but also is the point that there are many jurisdictions that are choosing not to look for that data. Um, and therefore you don't have to address uh, the issue or the concern. Uh, one thing I would note is that there is a comment in the chat function um, that New Mexico, for example, did send a vaccine to the Navajo peoples that live on reservations. I'm not sure about the details or the context around that. And unfortunately, I'm not able to give access to uh, other people to comment, but I will put that out there uh, for information. And I think, again, what's interesting is that many jurisdictions have had some kind of national directive, but have in fact allowed um, 
groups, political groups, be they uh, provinces, states, cantons, et cetera, to actually manage the rollout of the vaccine. And some of that management has included uh, flexibility with respect to whether or not they follow what are actually issued um, as national guidelines. Um, one other comment just from the chat box that I want to bring into this and then uh, open it up again for, for comment is uh, a comment about uh, migrant workers. Um, and that also makes me think specifically about um, people who are part of the food industry and whether we think about them as essential workers um, and the specific risk factors uh, that they might be exposed to, but also in some cases, the particular fears that they might have about how trying to come forward to access vaccination, which is in everyone's interest, including their own, uh, might put them at risk socially in another kind of context. So there's another population that hasn't made it onto most of the lists. Um, and so again, just a question about what people think uh, of the list in their country and ways in which it could either be modified or is there anyone prepared to uh, advocate that it should be jettisoned um, and we go for open access. So maybe Bjorn or Jan Eric, if you'd like to join in. Sure, if, if I may. Um, so I, yeah, I would like to reflect a little bit about the, the question of uh, a, a trust and, uh, and uh, safety and security, like also Kaya pointed out. Uh, thinking of this situation in Finland, I think the current guidelines and this list, priority list, so uh, they sort of uh, bring a sense of uh, security and safety for, for, for people. And um, I think the culture also plays a role. Like here in, in, in Finland, um, no one, there's no like professional group that has a priority um, uh, over, over other groups. There's no, um, no teachers or, 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 or other uh, groups that, that have, a, have, a, have a first take on the vaccine, apart from those health workers who, who work with COVID-19 uh, infected. So in a way, um, um, it also goes to this question of uh, how society is, is structured. And um, in, for instance, in, in Finland, uh, people uh, believe in equal society. And uh, in a way, no one, no one ha has a priority to, to, to other people. If I may uh, jump in, uh, I would just uh, very much uh, endorse what Jan Erik uh, said also for, for Norway. Uh, the criteria uh, which I uh, mentioned and also the values behind them, the goals, the identified goals, although the criteria um, got some uh, criticism and also uh, from health professionals who thought that they should have a higher priority. I think uh, the transparency and openness uh, in general, um, uh, made people feel that this is uh, fairly uh, reasonable and also increase their their trust in this. But of course, there will be be local uh, local uh, debates uh, whether to amend them or not. And this, I think, also relates to the other question that you raised, was um, uh, with regards to efficiency versus equity, because uh, in Norway we're quite homogeneous still, although the differences and disparities are increasing, it's still quite homogeneous. So uh, people will accept um, that uh, the access will be uh, fairly uh, good uh, for, for most uh, parts of the, uh, the people. So they, they think that uh, efficiency is important because equity uh, will be obtained in, in a reasonable amount. And I think uh, quite a lot of are um, worried about the logistics uh, uh, so that it's uh, important to get it out to people as, as quick uh, as, uh, as uh, possible. So I think one of the things that's important is that it's very clear that trust matters. Um, and it matters because if you expect people to wait their turn in line, they have to believe that the ordering, the prioritization is fair, they have to be willing to support it and therefore wait their turn in line. Now we've seen a number of cases where that hasn't been true for a variety of reasons. Um, but there's some cases where people are actually then trying to jump the queue, whereas other 
places and other people are trying to amend the list or make a claim uh, on behalf of their community. And I want to put out there two different kinds of claims that we've heard for comment. So one of them is depending on how it's um, written in terms of the uh, prioritization list, some countries have been open-ended and spoken about healthcare workers. Others have been more specific about healthcare workers who are on the front line. Some people have said, um, even so, there's a problem insofar as it should say the healthcare setting. And in that way, you would capture people who work in the cafeteria. You would capture people who clear um, the streets. Uh, if you're in a country that has snow, um, you would be you know, also including uh, janitorial services, orderlies, a number of other people who arguably are in a high risk environment who are not necessarily captured by the claim uh, healthcare workers. So that's one thing that I'd like you to think about. The other thing is that um, nowhere per se is uh, aggressively arguing for making the vaccine available to those under the age of 16 because we don't in fact have the data for that. But what we have seen is a number of people making comments, claims that educators should be higher up on the list um, because they might be exposed to the vaccine. And in some cases they have ended up on those prioritization lists and in other cases they haven't. So I just like to put those two communities or examples out there for comment. Um, how broadly should we understand uh, healthcare workers? Um, does that include our paramedics, for example? Does that include uh, our firefighters or police who might be on the scene of accidents, for example, bringing people into the healthcare setting? Um, does it include um, all of the, as we've referred to, lower paid workers who make that system work? Um, so one question, and then the other one, depending on your interest, um, what do people think about those who are educators? I'll open it up for comment. Angus, I'm going to call on you. Okay. You, you okay. know something about children, don't you? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh I think in terms of healthcare workers in the UK, the definition is quite broad. So it's healthcare and social care. And in the hospital settings, it includes uh, uh, cleaners and people who work in the cafeteria and porters and everybody. So it's not, it's not only uh, doctors and nurses in a narrow definition. But in other countries, that may be different. I don't know. But in the UK, generally, I think that's quite good. The The question about education, I think, is very difficult. Um, uh, because the, the, the I think there is rather little evidence that school teachers are or have a higher rate of disease and mortality than other people in the general population. So they will have, they, their risk will be graded by age, obviously. And so a, a 60 year old teacher will have a higher risk than a 30 year old teacher, clearly. Um, but I don't think there's any evidence that their rates of disease of needing hospital admission or of mortality are any higher than for other people. So to, to give them higher, to give, to give them preferred access to immunization would um, disadvantage some others in the population who are actually at higher need. Um, but of course, data is incomplete, you know, and I think in one or two years time, when everything can be looked at with hindsight, then we will know much more. But so perhaps this is wrong, what I'm saying, but certainly on the evidence at the moment, I think it's right. Okay, I'm going to move on to one of the other questions from uh, one of our viewers, and I'll just read this verbatim. Do any of the countries have strategies or policies on how to distribute vaccines to homeless people who are socially vulnerable? And if yes, could anyone share that information? So it's a, a pointed question. Does anyone have a know of or have information about a country that has a plan for dealing with homeless people? <clears throat> I mean, I can say something quickly about the UK, that there has been a major effort to get everybody off the streets. 
And so a lot of people who would have been homeless have been accommodated uh, in hotels and guest houses and bed and breakfast accommodation and so on. So uh, that, that has, I'm sure it is not complete, but I think a big effort has been made to do it. Um, and, and so once they have an address, that they then become accessible to the immunizer, the people I try to find and track down people to invite for immunization. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there will be lots of cases where this has not worked, but there is rhetoric around and quite a lot of effort to achieve that. Anyone else have information about a country that has a plan for dealing with those who are homeless? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't have exact information about the situation in Finland for the homeless, but I know that uh, certain uh, municipalities, they have their own say how to uh, deliver uh, the vaccines and some areas have um, uh, tried out supermarkets and, and uh, places where people actually are. So, so in technically, uh, this, this, this could be possible. Okay, I'll move on to another question. Could panelists offer any thoughts on how vaccine nationalism may be challenged or overcome? Uh, there seem to be many good reasons to do so, but equally it seems unlikely that we will achieve vaccine cosmopolitanism in the near future. So any thoughts, and several of us have commented on this as a serious problem, um, if we were to put on our thinking caps and be positive, uh, how would we um, try to address that? Sure. The first step is to reveal it uh, in the international community. Uh, so that will be uh, the, the first step and to, to point to it as a, a real uh, problem. Well, as somebody who has done that on social media with respect to my own government, where I have called some of its behaviors shameful, it's been quite interesting to me um, commentary back. Now, again, social media is not the best place to have a conversation, um, but people who thought that I was wrong to use that kind of language to describe uh, the decision made by my government. Um, my own view is that the only way any government will change is if the people stand up and say, this is wrong, and people stand up and say, I will wait my turn in line, and I now understand the line to be a global line. So, for example, all healthcare providers around the globe would then get vaccinated before me, and I would accept that. Um, I think right now, sadly, we do have efforts to name this globally. I think that um, the WHO, UNICEF, international organizations have said that we are on the verge of a moral catastrophe. And thus far, um, it does not appear to have um, activated any government to try to make a shift or to try to engage in a conversation with its people. But I guess my own view or understanding of power is that ultimately it needs to come from the base because politicians don't trust that they won't lose the next election if they can't say to the population, we saved your lives. Um, and so in fact, I think you need to have a certain kind of conversation and get people to understand that a pandemic is global and therefore the only way you can ultimately protect yourself is to protect everyone. And I think that that point still has not been understood. Um, and partly I believe it's because we don't have sufficient trust in our governments that we would believe that they would be acting in our best interests. Um, so that's my thought on that. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything else with respect to how to combat um, the problem that we all see uh, of vaccine nationalism. Any other thoughts or comments specifically about that? Let me move on then to another uh, co question, comment. Um, one of the uh, attendees has said controversial in the US and it's also I know to be controversial in Canada and elsewhere are vaccinating prisoners who are at high risk, um, as well as you know, people living in group home with disabilities, et cetera, who tend to have been forgotten. Um, I think the point here is that these are people also living in aggregate uh, living conditions, um, who are also therefore at increased risk, and that there seems to be more sympathy for uh, people in long-term care facilities who also happen to be older, as compared with other people who are also um, in state institutions, but for different reasons. 
any comments on that or anything that you can share with respect to the conversation in your own country? Perhaps uh, let's focus on prisoners. Um, should they get access to the vaccine? Where should they be in that prioritization list? I know what I think, which are probably the same as you, as yours, that they, they should, um, well, because they are uh, in a closed institution, they are at higher risk. And uh, although a lot of them are young, I think their their priority should be somewhat higher than other people of their age. Um, but, yeah, but I don't, I'm not aware that UK has adopted that policy. Uh, I doubt it. Anyone else know if prisoners are being vaccinated in your country? In Canada, some of them are, but they tend to be in a very specific band where their health condition also exacerbates their vulnerability. So we haven't seen a commitment to all prisoners in prison or all incarcerated persons in prison. Um, we have seen some and it has, you know, met with a little bit of commentary, not much largely because the numbers are not great. Um, but does anybody else have experience with this issue? This has not been very much debated in Norway uh, because uh, the infection rate is so low and uh, also uh, the number of doses of vaccines is still very, very low. So, so there has not been very much attention to that in Norway yet. Right. Angus, I'm going to come back to you because we have a question that's specific to a comment that you um, made. And it says, Angus Clark mentioned that there was some discussion of triage. Is there any discussion anywhere about what should be done for people who are triaged out? That is those who will not get access to a ventilator, will not get admitted to the ICU, don't get access to treatment that might save them. Um, the provocative question at the end, do we just kick the losers in a triage situation to the curb? So it's a little bit beyond the issue of vaccine, but I think the reason I wanna bring it up is because it does also um, focus on the issue of what happens to those who are not going to get access in this case to treatment, but that are not perhaps going to get access to vaccination. Any thoughts, Angus? Uh, are you wanting me to think about access to treatment then rather than? Well, I would actually be sort of wanting to bring it back to our topic, but just recognizing that in part, it's prompted by this question of what happens when you make decisions under conditions of scarcity. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of access to treatment, I suppose there, there have been um, a, two different discussions. There's been a bit of a public discussion about disability and people who are vulnerable because of that. Um, who have been uh, scared that they're likely or that, that the higher chance of a poor outcome if they have severe chest disease means that resources are less likely to be used to, kept, to keep them alive. I mean, that has been avoided, I mean, partly because we've been lucky and full ventilation is not needed as often as people had thought for treating COVID. Um, and partly because uh, we've not really run out of ventilator capacity. I mean, it's been, I think, it's, well, that's arguable. It's, but there have, a lot of people have been taken off ventilators when they have failed to respond after some days. But I think everyone, I can't speak, you know, for every single patient, but generally, um, people who need a ventilator have had access to one, even if only for a few days. So they haven't always been kept on a ventilator until they die. But if they've not responded, they have then been, then been taken off. Um, so those fears haven't quite materialised as much as they might have. So that's been helpful, but it's been fortunate. Right. Um, that doesn't really answer your question, though. That's okay. Hopefully the uh, attendee who put it there is uh, pleased with some of the response there. I want to ask a pointed question. Um, not that long ago, uh, Amazon, a global company, uh, made a claim that its workers should have privileged access to the vaccine because they are at risk and they are serving an essential function, given that many of us are now in our homes and ordering things through this particular company. 
um, or other companies, but basically choosing that. Now, what do people think of the claim being made that Amazon workers should have access, privileged access to the vaccine? So that's the first question. And the second question really is, at some point, is it right? Or I would go further and ask, do employers, will employers have an, ab an obligation to both advocate for access to vaccine on behalf of their workers, and if not at a later stage, to actually provide vaccine for their workers. So this is really looking a little bit more uh, to the future at a time when we imagine, hopefully globally, that all healthcare providers and all high-risk patients have been vaccinated. But I just thought we'd end with that kind of a forward-looking thing, but also anchored in today. <laughs> Do we think that Amazon workers are essential workers, they should have privileged access to the vaccine, do we think that employers have special responsibilities to their workers to either advocate for them getting the vaccine or to actually provide it? I'll start with you, Angus, and then we'll yeah, go sorry. through everyone I, I, and we'll end with I that question. I can't resist just coming in on that. I mean, that is just so utterly hypocritical. Um, I think, yes, I think there is a good case for Amazon workers having, having uh, immunization, um, as with many, many other people. But when Amazon has avoided paying taxes in so many countries, um, and it is those taxes that set up the social infrastructure that allows immunization, then they have no right to call for it at all. Um, so if this was in the context of a fair system of taxation imposed on multinational companies through EU, uh, North America, other countries, then it, that I would listen to that more seriously. Yeah, and Eric, would you weigh in on that, either specific to Amazon or with respect to other companies and their obligations vis-a-vis -vis their employees? And we might think here about vulnerable groups amongst those employees. I think uh, when there's a limited number of vaccines, there's, there's always a line. And then the question is that who, who can cut the line? Who, who can jump in? Um, but uh, I think uh, regulation is needed, governments are needed uh, to, to, to protect those who, who, who need protection most, such as vulnerable populations. Gaia, your thoughts on this? I just wanted to add on uh, maybe a little bit critic, critical uh, with regard to the Amazon workers, because they are Amazon workers and uh, not any other uh, company providing basic uh, uh, services. But um, I just wanted to, to, to stress that we, we, we are um, in, in public health systems, we are, uh, we are uh, um, managing the, the pandemics with this uh, approach, which is ma mainly focused on primary prevention, instead of considering the importance of uh, secondary preventions and recognizing the, 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 the new vulnerabilities in our social groups. So I, I, would, uh, I, I would say that we, we need to, to rethink the vaccination campaign also with this secondary prevention in mind and including more and more vulnerabilities and social vulnerabilities in the, in the way we prioritize groups. But again, because of the vaccination capacity is limited, we still have to draw lines and to, and to, make, um, and to make decisions. Thanks, Bjorn. Yes, um, the first question is of course, uh, are the workers of higher risk with regards to their health? If not, uh, the next criterion is, okay, is this an essential uh, service or a critical infrastructure? And of course, it, it may be, but it's not obvious in, in this specific case. So uh, I think they would uh, have a, a quite poor chance in, in, in Norway. And then your question with regards to, okay, do uh, employers have a responsibility for uh, promoting the interests of their uh, workers. Well, I think uh, it's important to see the interest of the workers in a broader perspective. It's not obvious that uh, claiming uh, the rights of these specific workers is a good thing for, uh, for them in the, in the long run, even uh, taking into account their health. Well, it falls to me to actually have to call this meeting to a close. Uh, we've been together for an hour. We've only touched the surface on some of the very important issues. I apologize to people who had uh, important comments in the chat that I was unable to get to, but you'll appreciate that uh, time was limited. 
I think I want to close by, first of all, thanking uh, all of those who attended, thanking the panelists, and thanking the Fondation Brochet for making this possible. But I also want to say that we have an obligation to think about how we are dealing with these critical issues, and not only for the here and now, but also for the future. We've been told that this is probably the first of many pandemics that we should be anticipating in the future. And I would suggest that we're not doing the best job. Um, if this is a trial run, we then better learn something from it and we better do better the next time. I think there are important questions to be discussed still about efficiency and equity. And I also think there are huge issues to discuss about the kind of world we want to live in. And I think the pandemic is a global event and we are choosing, and I do believe it is a choice, not to see it as a global event and not to respond in a global way. We've presented you with information about what different countries are doing. I stress again, this is illustrative, not comprehensive, but the problem is we're not in a position to have a conversation across borders. And yet what's interesting is that most countries have come up with very similar prioritization lists. And so what's missing is the will uh, to see us all as one people. I know that's a bit depressing thought to leave on, but I wanna say we can learn. That's the wonderful thing about humans and we will learn and hopefully we will do better. So thank you everyone for participating. That's both the participants on the panel and the attendees. And please join up for the next meetup on another facet of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much.